Everyone. Welcome to the Monday morning edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 571. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. It's the 3rd of February, 2020. Welcome to another program of Anglican Unscripted. We, we're glad you took time to sit down and listen to us or watch us, however you want to do it. Uh, if you like the program, like it. We appreciate that very much, whether you find us on Facebook or YouTube. If you think this is a great conversation and you want to help continue the conversation, go to the comments section and give us your opinion on what we're talking about. You'll see in the last couple of episodes, we're getting hundreds of comments for each uh, topic and uh, episode we talk about. We really appreciate that. If you're not subscribed yet, please subscribe to the show. Gentlemen, the whole world has changed since we met last. Britain has Brexited. Uh, Gavin, bring us up to, to, to speed. How was uh, the reaction to the, the vote that happened almost four years ago now? Uh, it, it's finally a, a thing. You Brexited. We have, and um, we had a moment of ecstatic triumph on the evening of the 31st of January. And then we were quite pleased the following day on February the 1st. And by February the 2nd, it was almost as if it never happened. We've simply moved into the new normal. Um, the, the, those who wanted a Brexit are happy. Uh, those who didn't want a Brexit have forgotten about it. And we're, we're heading off into a, into a new self-determined future, as self-determined as you can get in the uh, in the amongst the pressures of globalization you said self-determination could i send you guys a copy of the declaration of independence and may go pretty far with what you guys are trying well, to achieve now that you're independent <laughs> a few people have said that we don't have an independence day and we should celebrate it now every year just like the americans january the 31st our own independence day hot dogs mustard ketchup hamburger you'll love independence day it's it's come a long way uh, George, um, I don't know if people know this because they don't see when people arrive. You were late to the show because you had a long staff meeting. I don't think people realize that you know I have uh, hardworking, full-time people on the show that uh, make time once or twice a week to do Unscripted, and I appreciate that. But people have to remember you are a full-time rector, and a lot of being a rector means meetings. How did it go today? Oh, three hours of meetings this morning. It it's the silly season, so I have events and projects and things all the way from this weekend where I'm taking two boatloads of children out into the Gulf of Mexico to watch manatees. To uh, I'm, I'm trying to teach the children the value of suffering. Um, oh, no. And therefore, we're going to go to a Philadelphia Phillies uh, preseason baseball game and watch them play the Boston Red Sox. And so two dozen children under the age of 15 accompanied by me shall dress in black with little red hats with a white pea on it and we shall mourn and grieve uh part of part of the episcopal way of uh, always coming up short in the end oh, oh, and, and yeah. the wonderful thing about taking kids out uh, essentially uh, snorkeling scuba diving but without tanks to look at manatees mm -hmm. it's really obnoxious ones i can leave out in the gulf of mexico and nobody will know <laughs> nobody will know <laughs> actually seeing the manatees was a, a highlight of our vacation in november when jill and i went down there was a lot of fun uh the cold I weather got... bring the cold weather brings them into the shallows yeah so it's not it's not deep sea diving or anything like that, but just very, you know, four or five feet of water. You have to wear a wetsuit because the water's in the mid-70s, uh, which for us is freezing Arctic temperatures. But you mm -hmm. then can go and be amongst the manatees as some of them are cal calving. And it's quite a fun thing if you've not done it before. We went diving with about six other people, and they put me in this huge wetsuit, which was gray. And I was mistaken a couple times as a manatee. But, you know, it's just... You've got the little bristly mustache. <laughs> got the, you, clearly the bristly mustache. A manatee with a snorkel. Uh, let's get on to the news. Uh, we talked about Brexit. I want to talk about the apology uh, tour that's kind of going on regarding the statement on civil partnerships from the Church of England House of Bishops. And Gavin and I talked about this a little bit more in pre-show, and we kind of did a, a, a little show on this. 
I want to know what the Church of England House of Bishops and the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Archbishop of York are afraid of. Are they afraid people are going to seize the cathedrals uh, because culture wants uh, to burn down anything holy? Are they afraid of disestablishment? Are they afraid that people are going to believe that when they say the Nicene Creed, they cross their fingers? What is going on with the kind of the, the lack of marketing principles the Church of England has here, George? Well, I think for our viewers who may not be up entirely on the details, approximately 10 days ago, the House of Bishops pressed a pastoral statement on civil partnerships. We've discussed this in detail in previous issues, so I won't get into the weeds here. But but the reason why was due to the a recent court case that may said civil partnerships can now be between opposite sex people, couples, whereas before they had been reserved for same sex couples. And the church had a stance on, on what this meant until the new law change. So the church had to come out and explain where things stood. And they issued a pastoral statement reaffirming what the church has always taught on marriage and human sexuality, that the proper use of sex, sexual expression is within male-female marriage. That is what every Christian denomination of any major import, say for the Episcopal Church, I guess, a traditional denomination has taught. And they released this and it caused a firestorm of anger from gay activists within the uh, Church of England. And then we saw some bishops begin to peel off. Some were expected, Alan Wilson, the Bishop of Buckingham. He put his name to a statement saying that this statement of uh, traditional Christian values held the Church of England up to ridicule. Then we have individual bishops and diocesan bishops, uh, starting with the Bishop of Gloucester, saying, well, I didn't realize what we were signing. This was just a business uh, issue of no debate, and there was nothing new here, and I just am so horrified at the ham-fisted way our stating the truth about God's revelation has been done. Until finally the two archbishops, Canterbury and York, issued an, uh, an apology that was so ambiguous that you couldn't tell whether they were apologizing for the offense other people had at the statement of traditional Christian values. So in essence, they were apologizing for the packaging, or were they apologizing for the product, the statement of Christian values? So it, it's quite, it, it is gross incompetence on an institutional level, how this was handled. And it was made doubly worse by the quick climb down by the archbishops of Canterbury. Everybody expects the Bishop of Buckingham to go ballistic anytime his point of view is not uh, made mainstream. But the archbishops of Canterbury, New York, did themselves a tremendous institutional disservice uh, by apologizing and being increasingly vague, apologizing for Christian principles. Gavin, what are they afraid of? Are they afraid of disestablishment? They're afraid of being unpopular, <clears throat> but um, I, I don't think it's just fear of, of being unpopular. I think there's something uh, really much more substantial at the heart of this, and that is they've, they've failed to notice that we've come to a moment of really serious cultural change. So in the same, people sometimes suggest that um, that every 500 years there is an enormous shakeout in the affairs of Christendom. And what's happened in the last 50 years is that our culture has stopped being Christian, and the Church of England is predicated upon ministering to a Christian culture and it hasn't woken up to the fact yet that the, Christ, the culture is sub-Christian and it has to change its relationship with it. So up until in the last few decades, it was possible for the Church of England to reach out evangelistically to a, to a, to a, a wilting Christian culture and say, come back home. Uh, we will make a Christian journey possible for you. Come, come, come back into the family. But actually in the last 20 years, something very serious has happened and the whole of society the whole of society, 90% of it, 95% of it, has become post-Christian. I, <laughs> I, uh, yeah. I heard a clang oh, in my yeah. ear. I thought, well, it was my watch. It's No, it's still your clocks. You know, I, know, it, I, I think you've just, you know, that's part of the problem is the church doesn't realize the culture has gone sub, 
sub uh, Christian making the church who's you know hand in hand with it sub Christian as well. They can't any longer define the lines between culture and the church. And when they go around apologizing for the gospel or being ashamed of the gospel, I I'm a little hurt and I feel very bad for them that they don't understand that part of Christendom is to be offensive to culture. It just it's a reality the 19- of the of the message we have. In the 1960s, we had the 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 the, the, the rather stale, dirty washing of German progressive theology, undermining the Nicene Creed. And on the whole, we were arguing about whether or not there was a virgin birth and Christ was resurrected. And and, and a lot of people in the in the church demanded orthodox belief from their bishops. They didn't always get it, but they demanded it. Somewhere between 1960 and the millennium, um, where it had become uh, unacceptable to live outside marriage in a sexual and amorous relationship. In secular terms, it became not only acceptable, but then shortly after that, normative. At no point has the church said, this is not a Christian ethic. This is not how we understand Christian marriage. Christian marriage matters. And this is, um, and it was that failure to notice this division between uh, the holiness of life, the transformed life of Christianity, as it expressed itself in, in terms of amorous sexuality and our identity, that led to the church being on the wrong side of the chasm. So at the moment, it's found itself still trying to invite people to come home to a religious uh, expression that it no longer has authority to, for or commands. Uh, and in doing so, has let go entirely of the Christian ethic and a proper Christian anthropology. But they don't seem to have noticed. They don't know, they've not discovered they're on the wrong side of this dotted line. If they if they read the New Testament uh, as it presents itself rather than through the lines of third-rate therapists, uh, they would see it again. But they're they're too afraid of losing the few people that they're hanging on to to find the courage to do that. I need to talk as long as we're still talking here about uh um news somebody sourced gavin me i sent it uh, a a uh, a facebook conversation that was uh, sent to me a long time ago like yesterday and uh i kind of want to talk about it because the people in this conversation are talking about what is going to be the future for the church of england how do we uh, separate ourselves from this sub church sub and uh, actually tackle culture one of the recommendations was to have a third province. Before we talk about that, how did uh, England get two provinces? Who wants to tackle that? Well, it's a historic division of the church. Geographic, it dates back, I think, uh, to the early Middle Ages. The province of York for the northern half of the kingdom, the province of Canterbury for the southern half. The Metropolitan of the South is the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Metropolitan of the North is the Archbishop of York. They, in the 19th century, they met together in synod to organize the affairs of the Church of England as a whole, as an entity. But until that time, there were, in essence, two Churches of England, if you wanted to state in terms of organizational structures, one York-based, one Canterbury-based. Now, a highly placed uh, person within the Church of England is floating the idea, and it's been floated before. I've heard this before that maybe a solution in dealing with all this is not to do a geographical York versus a a Canterbury, but to have a third province for those who are sane, for those who are believers. And I thought we should talk about that. Is something like this uh, a viable solution to deal with the insanity going on right now with the House of Bishops, with the synods, with the leadership in the Anglican uh, communion, so to speak? Uh, who wants to pick on this one? Well, I'll give it a little. I, I, go ahead, Gavin. Go, go Gavin. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, well, the reason I, I, I'd like to is because um, uh, the, I don't know if this was a private Facebook page or not, but I think we all of us have to assume that if you put anything on Facebook, it's not private. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you might want it to be, but, uh, but, but, but essentially anything we put on the internet is liable to be copied and to be sent around. And um, so uh, if it was private, um, Bishop 
Pete Wilsden Broadbent, then I'm sorry, but it isn't anymore. And um, and I and I hope you'll benefit from our discussing it in public because I I, I think you've been silly. Uh, dear Pete Broadbent, whom I, I I knew a little, has a reputation of being silly sometimes. He he was a bishop who dyed his hair purple one Lent in General Synod. He, he used to come in in very fetching black motorbike waistcoats and and make sure that people realized there were trendy elements to the house of bishops but um he was he always had a very good political judgment he was on the evangelical side pete broadbent's experience of the politics and the political machinery of the church of england is second to none and and that's why i want to to lay it at his feet because if anybody else had said this i i think one would have just said look don't be so stupid it's this is so right no it, it, this is so far out on the bounds of possibility that, that you you know you, whoever said it has to be an inexperienced um I idealist without much um street cred but the fact that pete broadbent said he thought he thinks that the answer to the crisis that besets evangelicals in the church of england is a third province third province i think shows the the bankruptcy of the political strategy at the very end of this he says having mentioned it of course the problem is that um it would be very hard to get a united front because those people who don't believe in women's ordination see us as as, uh, as heretics or uh, suboptimal some phrase he used um now the, the the historic fact the reason why i i'm i <laughs> i, I uh, laugh this to scorn is that the Anglo-Catholic movement, of whom I was a, a, a member on General Synod, when it came to the consecration of women bishops, tried very hard to get a third province. Indeed, if they'd got a third province, uh, I might still have been able to be an Anglican, and so might many others who've left. But but they failed. Um, the third province would have given uh, uh, traditional Orthodox Anglicans a hermetically sealed place where Episcopal, Orthodox Episcopal oversight could take place. And if you're an Anglican, you have to have Orthodox Episcopal oversight or it breaks your umbilical cord and you start becoming a, a false Anglican and a, and a false Episcopalian and a Congregationalist. Now, the Anglo-Catholics failed. They had they almost made it, but they did at least have a united front. I mean, it really was seriously united. The, the the idea that the evangelicals could get the central part of the Church of England to, to grant them effectively this separatist movement where you have all the privileges of being in the Church of England but none of the responsibilities uh, at this stage is is just la-la land. It could well, never happen. Even, even if they were 100% united, uh, they would not have the power or the leverage to get it to happen. But as Broadbent says... They're so far from being united that 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 how how would they present themselves? On what terms would they come to negotiate with or without women priests? Well, already you now have a third province and a would-be fourth province. It's ludicrous and it's a sign of desperation and I think incoherence. The fact is there are a number of people in the Church of England, both bishops and laity, who'd like to remain orthodox, but they have no institutional mechanism for doing so, and therefore they're doomed. If I remember correctly, the solution they came up with was mutual flourishing and flying bishops. Yeah, is that that's correct, right? Where uh, you can pick correct. your bishop, and uh, uh, you would have mutual flourishing of you know women's orders and non-women orders. And so, uh, the Church let, of England let, 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 is let, let, an let, example where both have failed. I, I had a, a friend of mine who fortunately doesn't watch the show. <laughs> was at a meeting with Caroline Boddington uh, talking about the Crown Appointments Commission. And this friend of mine... Tell us who uh, Caroline Boddington... Tell our viewers who Caroline Boddington is. Yeah, we got a lot of people Caroline, playing catch-up. <laughs> Caroline Boddington is the architect of the new Church of England. The Church of England is run by small committees. She runs the most powerful committee of all, which is called the Crown Appointments Commission. She's been there about 20 to 25 years and 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 she is a civil servant. She's the gatekeeper to all principal appointments. For some time, she ran an alternative women's bishops training group, 
long before the Church of England had ever agreed to women bishops, such is her power, so that they should be, as Boris Johnson said about his free trade agreement, oven ready when the moment came. Uh, if she blocks you uh, in terms of the pro promotion to the role of a bishop, you're finished in the Church of England. Um, and she, behind the scenes, has set the direction and the tone and the political strategy for everything the Church of England has become. There was a moment when I, when I needed to tell Rowan Williams of some fairly aberrant behaviour she was involved in. And, and uh, I got his chaplain to agree to pass him a note at breakfast so it would make its way through the various secretaries. And the reason I didn't send it was because I asked myself what the, out, what the intended outcome would be. What power did Rowan Williams have in the face of the institutional uh, gearing that, that, um, uh, that Caroline Boddington had? And the answer was he had none whatsoever. He couldn't fire her. She was employed by the institution. He couldn't reprimand her. He, wasn't his, he was not her line manager. There was nothing the Archbishop of Canterbury in those days could have done if he had wanted to. It's changed slightly since because Justin Welby has very sensibly organized the levers of power so that they are more amenable, closer to his reach. But uh, Caroline, to back to the script, so Caroline Boddington at this meeting of reviewing the Crown Appointments Committee procedure uh, said to people there, mutual flourishing hasn't worked, has it? We ought to give some attention to seeing if we can make it work a bit better. Now, first of all, I don't believe she meant that because she has no investment at all in mutual flourishing apart from a cosmetic, uh, a cosmetic delivery of it, which is why it hasn't worked. But I mention it because it hasn't worked remotely. Um, Philip North was the most obvious casualty to it. And if you say, if you say how many Orthodox, Catholic or Evangelical clergy have been appointed to the office of Archdeacon or above, in the last five years, the answer is not zero. one. Yeah, zero. Uh, so, so mutual flourishing, that, that's a very brief history of mutual flourishing as it is up until today. You're right, Kevin, that was supposed to be the way forward. It's a cul-de-sac. Well, and I think the same with, with more provinces. You know, and I don't think any way possible to get an agreement in non-geographical terms of having a province built on people who just don't like the uh, House of Bishops of, the, of uh, the Church of England. What what is the where's the unifying factor in that? And uh, I don't think you can do it. Part of the you might ask you might ask Pete Broadbent onto the show and ask him to explain himself. <laughs> it, would be, it would be very interesting. To, to hear. <laughs> <laughs> part, of, part of the unifying factor in other situations, such as the Anglican Church in North America, is the caliber of leadership. And what we see is there are some wonderful men in the office of bishop in the Church of England who are faithful uh, Christians. They, the problem is, I'm going to use language from my uh, staff meeting this morning, we have a mismatch oh. between long-term and short-term assets and liabilities. Um, the bishops who are conservative and strong on these issues um, lead a group of people where the clergy who are conservative and strong have different views on the ordination of women. So they are not able to overcome this divide of those people who are squeaking the loudest about uh, change and uh, re redrawing the lines. Their leadership uh, does not represent them. We have a situation in the Diocese of London. Jonathan Baker is the flying bishop. Jonathan Baker is the bishop there for Anglo-Catholics who cannot accept in good conscience the orders of women and who hold to various traditional standards of married life and church teachings and this and that. Well, Jonathan Baker is an own goal by the Church of England. First off, he gave up being a Freemason in order to become a bishop. Now, this is horrific for most Anglo-Catholics that you would have a former Freemason who only dropped it, not because he felt it was wrong, but because he felt he needed to uh, get rid of something on his resume that would be difficult. Then he got divorced. Then he got married to the divorced wife of one of his priests. And this is the bishop who is supposed to supervise those clergy who will not marry divorcees. He himself is divorced and remarried. And this is the leader that the Church of England has given for that 
section of conservative Anglo-Catholics is somebody whose own life and standards and Episcopal behavior doesn't meet the cut is just as bad as the as the gender of the Bishop of London for some people. It's, George, it's, a, mismatch. Very generous. it's a mismatch between with the strengths in the House of Bishops and the strengths among the clergy and congregations and lay people. George, you've been very generous about the caliber of some of the Church of England bishops, and you won't be surprised that I I, I, I don't share your views. Um, but but let me just ask you, on the, on, on the two big issues of the day, Islam and sexuality, is there a single one of these bishops who has spoken out and articulated the traditional Christian view on these matters? Well, there is, but he's retired. His name is Michael Nazarali. Yeah. He was. He was the last. My, one. Michael is the, my, Michael is the exception, and as you say, he's yeah. retired. There are no others. I, yeah. I, none, none other have. And so, although Lord have mercy upon me, a sinner, I, I don't hold myself up to to be uh, any better than anybody else. But I, if I'm looking for examples of orthodox ecclesial leadership, I don't see anyone who's said what is required of them on these two critical issues of the day. So I th I'm afraid I think the quality of Episcopal leadership is lower than you in your characteristic generosity have attributed it. Well, I, I don't think it's just bishop leadership or clergy, it's evangelical leadership in uh, England. I had a person, a evangelical leader, uh, professor from over in England agree to do an interview and uh, it was gonna be cosmic, it was, it was a great topic and at the last minute, he a no show. So you know, I think there's just people who are not willing to talk about the hard topics because there's there's a built-in fear. I don't know if it's a, a fear of Twitter. It's a fear of being a, attacked relentlessly by the twenty people who uh, have issues, or if it's a you know a fear of uh, who they work with. I don't I don't understand it. Uh, we have some friends who are conservative Church of England clergy who have put together organizations in their diocese to redirect the parish share. They withhold the money from the diocese and put it to one side to use for other church works. And this has caused a disproportionately high degree of outrage from the establishment. And I remember going to Jerusalem for the GAFCON meeting and talking to some of these leaders at the, the tables who were complaining about their bishops, complaining about the Church of England. And I said, look, I can read a financial statement. There are some dioceses that are so close above the waterline that if you just organize your folks and withhold the parish share, they will go under financially. You can bankrupt them. You have power that you're not using. And the response was, well, that's a very American way of doing things. We're going to continue sending the money and then just come to meetings and complain. Uh, I'm making light of their situation, but there's not been a leadership. There's not been a willingness among those people who feel most strongly and have the best arguments of actually getting out the knives and doing the hard work of fighting. And they have, they have demography on their side. We published on Anglican Inc. a report about where the children who attend the Church of England congregations. Well, some incredibly huge, I think it was three quarters, two thirds, attend the 10 or 15% of conservative evangelical parishes. So the people who will be in the Church of England in the building in 25 years are not in worshiping in the uh, mainstream Church of England congregations where the majority have no children under 16. They're in these evangelical parishes. They're the ones that have money. They're the ones that have outreach. They're the ones that are doing all the great work that are being trumpeted time and again by the national institutions. Yet there's been a shyness on, part, on the part of some of these clergy leaders to take the battle to the enemy. Instead, they're content with fighting a defensive war. And you never win, you never win the battle, you never win by fighting a defensive war. You have to go in the offense at a certain point. Let's do one final transition for today, and I want to talk quickly about uh, the violence going on in countries like Nigeria. It's it's getting worse, and I think it you know it's it's bad enough we have to talk about it on unscripted. Um, there's a war out there, and we need to be praying for our Christian brothers and sisters. Uh, what's the latest on Nigeria, George? Oh. Uh... 
Was it a, a seminarian? It, well, there was a Roman Catholic seminarian, 18-year-old boy who was abducted and murdered. The uh, One of the aid agencies, I think it might have been Christian Solidarity, Solidarity Worldwide, mm -hmm. uh, we ran one of their stories on Anglican Inc. where they're saying genocide is taking place in Nigeria. The African Christians in the Muslim-majority portions of the country are being murdered. Um, we can go across the whole belt of Central Africa. We go to places people don't really imagine as being front lines, but in the Congo, in the Eastern Congo, Islamic militias are coming into Christian villages. An Anglican priest was murdered last weekend on his way to church by a Muslim militia in the Congo. And what's happening is that these Islamic groups are becoming more and more radicalized in the Congo, in, um, in Burkina Faso, in Mali, in Nigeria, Niger, and in Somalia, and in Kenya, and in Uganda. And what's happening is that the situation is becoming more um, attempts at de-radicalization have not worked. And the fight is being brought to Christians by Muslim groups at this point. Now, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a sectarian conflict, which is both sides are equal fighting each other over this or that. It's one group is a great, engaged in an aggressive campaign to seize power and control and stamp out the other. And that's Islam, radical Islam, in the central belt of Africa right now. Gavin? There is a very moving video, which I'd like to post, if, if, if I may. Sure. If you don't I'll find put it a link to it, yeah. Um, I saw it about four years ago, and it's from a Roman Catholic bishop in, the, in Nigeria called Bishop Oliver. Uh, and he talks about the way in which he spends every Saturday night uh, in the sanctuary. Um, before the Blessed Sacrament. And he had a vision of our Lord. And he said, this is, he, he starts off by saying, dear people, you must understand the Lord didn't come to see me because I'm a holy bishop. I'm a very ordinary, ordinary person. But he came to see me because he loves you and wants to give you a message. And the bishop was very surprised because Jesus stood there with a sword in his hand. Uh, and Bishop Oliver said, I've never seen Jesus with a sword in his hand. This is not what I expected. And the Lord approached him with a sword and so he held out his own hand, and as the sword touched his hands, it turned into the rosary. And then our Lord said three times, uh, Boko Haram is, is finished. And so the, the bishop then put this video up for his, for his diocese, which, which people can see if they're interested, and said, my dears, we have to pray. This is a spiritual battle. We mustn't take up arms. We mustn't run away. We have to get on our knees and pray. Strangely enough, I was interpreting, uh, translating from the French at a pilgrimage in Rome to this strange African bishop whose diction I, I could hardly understand. And in the middle, I was standing on a stage in front of a thousand people and I suddenly realized it was him. As so I'd seen the story, I, I, I knew what the ending was. So, uh, uh, um, and I, I met him personally and he turns out to be a, a man of considerable integrity. The only reason I tell the story is not because I want to upset people with the rosary, um, said that to one side and turn, turn to prayer if you like, but, you don't often hear of bishops having visions of Jesus. And, and the, the women who were kidnapped, those 300, they were his women. They were Catholic girls from his diocese. So he's heavily invested in the suffering of his people. And again, he was asked by his people not to wear his Episcopal robes in public in case he should be killed. And he said, I, I refuse to change my, my robes. I will, I will be your bishop and be seen as your bishop. So Bishop Oliver is a very splendid man, but I tell the story because I think we need to be reminded that this is, that although, as George says, de-radicalization is the option of choice for most social scientists and politicians, if this vision is right and it was real, what we're facing is a spiritual conflict with the other side who are using Muslims and Islam to attack Christianity. And as we look around the world, it is Islam that is moving against Christianity with a profound spiritual hatred. And the only thing that can combat it is witness and prayer. And that's what our bishops should be calling us to. One of the stories I posted recently in Anglican Inc. dealt with the Rohingya, which are a Muslim minority in uh, Burma, Myanmar. They are, uh, they, they are ethnic uh, Burmese and various tribes who adopted Islam when the Bengali Muslims came over the border. 
they have been treated abysmally by the Muslim, by the Myanmar military junta. And hundreds of thousands have been driven into exile in, in refugee camps along the border with Bangladesh. Bangladesh will not take them. Even though they are Muslims, they're not uh, Bengalis. Now, one of the story I published this past week is here's a, here's a people who have been uh, persecuted for their religious faith, for their different ethnicity. Within there, there are several thousand Rohingya Christians, form, people who were formerly Muslims, who through the activities of the Anglican Church of Myanmar have come to Jesus Christ. In these refugee camps in, in, in Bangladesh, who is being murdered? The Christian minority of the Muslim majority who fled the, the Buddhist majority are the ones who are receiving the short end of the stick. It, you know, you can, it, it's, it's an appalling travesty that we're seeing being done around the world. It's, it's, it's true. Um, it, I saw a couple more stories I wanted to talk about, but I think we'll save it for Friday. Um, certainly the, the, uh, Sherry Vaughn, uh, statement stuff like that we'll, we'll say for the next show, uh, cause we're busy people and it's one thirty on a Monday and I got phone calls already. So I got to get busy and I know George has to get to back to church work. Gavin, I, I got to ask again, I don't recognize the bookshelf behind you, England or France. Where are you at? England. Hey, You're in England. England. Okay. Right. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so uh, I you guys have got a little union blackout over the book, so we, you know, people That's can tell really a lot. <laughs> Kevin, can we uh, just respond to one uh, viewer question that I thought? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, answer. absolutely. If you got one, sure. One of our viewers asked us to name our favorite Catholic theologian living and our favorite Anglican Bible scholar living, and. That's a really, really hard thing to say, because I can tell you who my favorite scholars on both sides are who are now dead. They've died in my lifetime. Uh, but uh, Gavin, how, who would you say is the Catholic uh, theologian scholar that you have read that you find to be of most value in your spiritual life right now? I wondered if I'd be able to reply, but actually I do know. Uh, and it's it's Ratzinger. It's Benedict. Um, Benedict's writings on 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 the Gospels, uh, and particularly as, as they apply liturgically. Um, I, I've just read a commentary he's written on the Psalms, which are used at morning prayer. And whenever I read him, he brings together what, what you have to have from a theologian. You have to have someone whose mind is buried in a profundity of their heart. Um, the Western tradition has treated theologians as brain boxes, academics, intellectuals, uh, people who deal with the pyrotechnics of intelligentsia. But, but Christian tradition has never understood that to be the theological task. The theological task is actually a prayer, a prayer and the marrying of this world in prayer. Um, and, and intelligence is not the most important thing. But of the most impressive writers, for me, it's, it's Ratzinger or, as he's now known, Pope Benedict. If I were to answer this question, uh, if Hans Urs von Balthasar had not died about 10 years ago, von Balthasar would be the man that I would have pointed to. But I agree with you entirely. And for me, it's Benedict's uh, infancy narratives, the uh, books he's written about that. Um, I'm very, I very, very think he's done a wonderful job. And he also is wonderfully stylistically. He's easily understood. Mm. In my own lifetime, I have gone from a deep reliance and devotion to the works of people like John Stott, and I've switched sides, and now I'm a Packer fan, J.I. Packer fan. You can't steal my answers. That's no, not going to help. I, I think it's because it's the Puritan uh, trajectory that I'm on, away from uh, away from Stott's more uh, cause people grief, more latitudinarian worldview into Packer's more rigorous worldview. But th that's just me. I'm, I'm talking now about biblical scholars. I read with uh, great pleasure. I think I meet, do I have one on my desk? No, I don't. But the Bible Speaks Today series put out by Stott and Alec Moynter and others are really, really phenomenally good books. They're not detailed, heavy academic studies, but they really are great for the pastor or the preacher. I, I'd like to do what you did, George, and change a question. If you can't answer the question, change it to one you can answer. And so, so for me, it would be C.S. Lewis. Um, yeah. Okay. I, now, I, I, if 
if we're going to go people who have recently died in the last you know <laughs> decade, I, I'm, I'm going to give my answer too here. Uh, I, I would say Oswald Chambers. I would say uh, uh, Stott for sure. J.R. Packer is probably the one I've read the most uh, of any. Uh, C.S. Lewis the second read most. Uh, Stott the third rest, you know, um, and Benedict, I've, of course, is uh, uh, human volunteer, great stuff. So I've read a great deal of Rowan Williams, and I find him fascinating, but I find him fascinating the way I find detective story fascinating mm. because I enjoy watching the cleverness and the facile way he uses language and thought. But do I find this as a door into my spiritual life? No, I don't. Uh, I say the same with N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright, very novel, very good stuff. Does it, you know, is it life-changing to Kevin's spirituality? Yeah, yeah. It's it's newish, but it's nothing new. Yeah. My so. my my two my two also rands would be Ken. Uh, Eric, they're, they're dead as well. There isn't anyone alive, I'm afraid. Would be Ken uh, Eric Maskell and Ken Leach. Le Leach wrote the most marvelous trio on spirituality where he where he drew it was he who really introduced me to the power of the, of the church fathers uh, and particularly the relationship between theology and prayer uh, and, and 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 maskell saw everything coming he wrote this amazing book called the secularization of the church of england uh, in in the 60s he, he saw it all but again he both he and leach combine heart and head and that for me is what is required by by a good theologian. Their heart has to be right with Jesus, they have to pray, and they have to bring an extra degree of clarity of mind to that heart, which is what makes them what they are. If I could also add some runners up, I am I am so blessed because my father spent an enormous amount of money educating me. Uh, and, I, and I didn't uh, give it full desert and justice. My systematic theology professor, when I studied it at, in seminary, was Avery Dulles, Cardinal Avery Dulles. And I got to know him as a person. We'd go to lunch together. He would come up from Fordham University to teach that year, and we would go to one of the eating clubs in New Haven, Morris. And I would listen to him, but I just didn't understand him. I didn't get it. And the second person was another Roman Catholic, completely different, but that was uh, René Girard. Now, I didn't have any sort of social relationship. He was a man at the podium in front of me and how many hundreds of other students. But, you know, I know I, I, I couldn't quite, it, this was above my league or my pay grade, but somebody like Packer, and I'm not saying it's because Packer writes to a lower level, it somehow touches me in a different way than someone like Rowan Williams or uh, Girard or, and so forth. Nobody mentioned Graham Leonard. Nobody mentioned, you know, well, it's fine. It's fine. So, yeah, that's that's our answers. Uh, that was a good comment to, to answer to. And what's our time limit here? I'm looking under the lights. 43 minutes. Guys, we pulled it in perfectly. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and you've been listening to episode 571 of Anglican Unscripted on the 3rd of February 2020. I still have no idea what day it is. <laughs> <laughs>